I want to make a little sort of apologizing. Uh, I am probably beginning to be a little senile. Uh, so I probably forgot that I said to some of you something of the sort that this concept uh, in my first lecture, it was uh, about homogenization and heterogenization this week. And I might have said something like, those concepts are not sort of existing in my tradition uh, as an economist or a sort of economist. Those concepts are alien to economists because in the economic model of perfect competitive markets, everything is homogeneous from the beginning and forever. Uh, so uh, the concept homogenization or heterogenization is totally outside the thought world of real economists. But I, I will try now, and I could have said then that, of course, this first lecture dealt with how the capitalist market homogenized the world, could, you could say. Uh, 1989, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the whole world was in a, a sort of capitalist market economy. Uh, of course, not homogeneous, but in a certain degree homogeneous. OK. And now this uh, week, the theme is power and resistance. And now I, I will really talk about power, capitalist power. And also in the afternoon uh, about uh, resistance. But not only resistance, also sort of alternative uh, if I might express this personal opinion, uh, it has been too much of resistance and too little of alternatives. Uh, so I will talk a little more about alternatives, perhaps, not only of resistance. Okay. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Academia, the academic world, revised their old world views in most academic fields. And I will try to summarize what four thinkers said. And the first one is this person. His name was Samuel Huntington in The Clash of Civilizations from 1993. And his message was, Civilization identity will be increasingly important in the future, and the world will be shaped in large measure by the interactions among seven or eight major civilizations. Western, Confucian, Japanese, Islamic, Hindu, Slavic, Orthodox, Latin American, and possibly African. I don't know why this possibly African, but anyway. Uh, the differences are the product of centuries. They will not soon disappear. And his uh, political message was the West will increasingly have to accommodate these, these non-Western modern civilizations. This will require the West to maintain its economic and military power. And yesterday, I listened to Jan Bachmann. And you had a discussion, very interesting discussion, about this uh, idea, liberal interventionism, with Tony Blair and this uh, Canadian, uh, uh, what's his name? Yeah. Huh? Ignacio. Ignacio, yes. Uh, as we have a responsibility, we, we democratic Westerners, to export our democratic, liberal ideas. And if they don't accept us, we have to do it by force. The second one, anyone recognizes this man? Anyone? 
one from Spain here. Well, his name is Manuel Casters, a Spanish sociologist, with his colossal work about the information age, published in three books, 96 to 98. And I, I try to summarize his message. Of course, it's very simplified. Uh, new information technologies have shaped new patterns of power and human relations. The polarization between West and East has been replaced by a polarization between small islands of power, wealth and knowledge, and the black holes of poverty, powerlessness and ignorance. The polarization is not only between continents, nations and regions, but also between parts of big cities. Here is to illustrate the, the uh, yeah, this little, uh, oh, no. Here is some, uh, probably New York or something, and there is burning cars in some suburb. Um, in those black holes, global terrorism have their roots. Religious and ethnical discords are more the results of than causes of this polarization. So unlike Huntington, he is not giving a, such a big role to religions. And he is a sort of a European Union uh, supporter says that the European Union can be an alternative to capitalism of the U.S. type. Stand up for democratic and egalitarian values, break down nationalism, and form a European identity. I don't know if you want to classify those persons in Jan Art Scholte's different categories. Perhaps you could call Castells a sort of social democrat, but not as a party politician, but in that sort of tradition. Uh, I wrote, I have on the literature list a, a, a little text that I wrote myself. I met Castells in a debate in Stockholm, and, and I said those things. Uh, and the idea, I, I think that his, his analysis of the collapse of the Soviet Empire is very good. It's about how they couldn't handle new technologies because of this very uh, bureaucratized uh, and hierarchical planning system. It couldn't absorb new information technologies. And, but I think that he overrates the power of those networks and underrates the power of the old sort of capitalist. Uh, yeah. But that's, that's my subjective view. And of course, you have a right to think something else. And here are those two guys. I have met Hart also in a debate in Stockholm once. Um, this is Michael Hart and Tony Negri. Tony Negri is an Italian. He was accused of being a member of the Red Brigades, but uh, I don't know exactly what was true. And, no. and they wrote a book, Empire, from the year published in 2000. And to summarize what they said is that US imperialism and other nation state based systems of power are rapidly weakening in the force fields of world capitalism. But globalization cannot be understood as a simple process of deregulating national markets. Far from withering away, regulations today proliferate and interlock to form a supranational order, the empire. The term refers to a rather diffuse, anonymous network of an all-englobing capitalist power. And I will come back to Horton Negri in my next lecture about resistance. Uh, I might say, say already now that it's a very difficult text. Lots of sort of uh, 
new concepts, uh, and they are probably also some sort of revolutionaries. And I just said to Ed May before the lecture that I think the concepts reformist and revolutionary is outdated. I mean, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, what is a revolutionary? Uh, well, very few believe in some sort of state revolution, uh, national state revolution. And uh, perhaps they believe in some sort of global revolution, but what that means, uh, I don't know. But we'll come back to them. Uh, but in my materialist perspective, academia and ideology played minor roles compared to a growing financial market. I think I said something of that sort the last time about neoliberalism, that in my opinion, my leftist friends, they overrate the role of neoliberalism. And neoliberalism is a result of global capitalist development, not the other way around. And since 1933, 73, when the mercantile exchange was formed, uh, you could buy and sell derivatives, currencies, stocks, and bonds for a fixed price on future dates. And since then, the global financial market has exploded. And here is a logarithmic curve or a logarithmic line. In 1970, $2 per day and citizen of the world was changed over the currency borders, so to say. And today, nobody knows exactly, but perhaps something in the order of magnitude $25,000 per day and citizen of the world is exchanged over borders via stocks and bonds and, and derivatives and whatever. And, uh, a very small part of this are payments for regular export and import of goods and services. So imagine that. I suppose nobody of you are handling $25,000 every day and send it all over the world, or perhaps some of you, but not many. So then you must imagine that some persons are handling much, much, much bigger amounts, those young persons sitting before the computers and sending one million dollars there and one million there and so on, every day. And this is a formidable power that is very difficult to resist, in my opinion, by politicians. Well, a little more about, this is not a lecture in economics, but I will make a little uh, exercise with you. Uh, I, I, this night I played poker on the uh, internet, and I won one million Swedish crowns. And I have got three offers. This morning I contacted different banks all over the world. I have got three, I, I can, Put it in a Swedish bank, okay, I can put it in the madras, but madras, what is madras in English? Uh, uh, mattress, yes. But also in a bank, and zero, it's actually the Swedish interest rate, central bank interest rate, right, minus 0 0.35%, but anyway, they, they don't dare to take money if you put, so it's zero. Then I got an offer from a German bank to change to Euro and get 1% uh, interest in a German bank. And I have also, no, wait, no. Ah. Oh. Okay, let's take it like this way. 
Uh, I also got uh, a um, offer from a Russian bank to get 5% interest rate if I change my money to rubles. Now please give me an advice. How many suggest that I will put it in the Swedish bank? Will you raise your hands? And how many will advise me to put it in the German bank? Will you raise your hands? Not so many. And how many will advise me to put it in the Russian bank? <laughs> well, you, you are not so many daring to give me an advice. But anyway, how do you think? How should I think? Of course, you m must also consider the risk that, for instance, the rubles will be weakened. So after a year, say that I must tell the bank that I will put them there for one year. In a year, what will happen in Russia? Well, perhaps the oil prices will go up again, and then the ruble will perhaps be stronger even. So that's a very profitable offer in that case. But perhaps also Putin make some real big mistakes. And and the oil prices go on to fall and so on. So you must also consider not only the interest rate, but also the, what you think about the future of the currency. And here they are, the smart guys sitting. And there is a so-called interest rate parity theorem that is sort of Economists' corresponding theory for Einstein's relativity theory. Um, the interest rate differential between two currencies is an in equilibrium equal to the differential between the forward exchange rate and the spot exchange rate. So if I consider, will I put the money in a Swedish bank or in a Russian bank? Then if Russia can, shall attract my money, they must have an interest rate that is so much higher than the Swedish interest rate that it compensates for the risk that I will, uh, that r the rubles will go down. In. So the fact that, for instance, the interest rate in the United States, the Federal Reserve's uh, steering interest rate is 0 0.25. And in uh, Brazil, for instance, is 15%. That is because people are still so afraid to put their money in Brazilian banks. Uh, so they prefer to give, give, get a secure and low interest rate in uh, dollars in, a, in an American bank. And as I said, in the beginning of the 90s, practically all, all sorts of national currency and credit controls were gone. And financial market power was bigger than ever before. Well, the neoliberalism, the belief in an unfettered capitalist market in the years 89 to 91 reached its peak. In its most extreme form, it meant that politicians' only role was to make laws securing property rights and capitalist power. In 1993, Swedish unemployment rate reached 10% and public debt passed 80% of GDP. If I use the European Union statistics concept. And with expansionary policy in the spirit of Keynes, most politicians and economists, including myself, thought that the negative effect because of increased interest rates and on borrowed money would exceed the positive effects of lower taxes or increased public expenditure on employment. And the Minister of Finance, Jörgen Persson, here he is. 
he said a quite famous quotation, nothing is more degrading for a Swedish politician than to be forced to explain the Swedish economy and welfare systems for 25 to 30 years old financial puppies in New York or London. I was also myself visited by two very well tailored young men from Standard & Poor because we cooperated with the government and they wanted to see this peculiar sort of person. My party leader was a woman and only that thing was very peculiar. And they said that uh, they, they, their task was to ask me about the policy of the left party. But they said that, well, actually, we are ex not so extremely interested in what you really say. The important thing is the image. This woman with high heels, that's a, a message to the market that something is wrong in Sweden. Something is wrong. Uh, yeah. Uh, and Together with the Social Democratic government, the left party made a comprising budget consolidation plan in the autumn of 1994, and some leftist friends of mine said that I was influenced by neoliberalism. Therefore, I cooperated with social democracy. So it is very easy, or was very easy, to be called a neoliberal in those days. But I, I, I can assure you, I'm not, perhaps I'm a sort of left liberal, but not a neoliberal. No. And John Williamson, he represented a more sort of moderate form of neoliberalism. He invented the term Washington Consensus Policy Reforms, that official Washington thought would be good for all national states, especially Latin America. It was formulated for all. Here is Williamson. Fiscal discipline. A, a re redirection of public expenditure priorities toward fields offering both high economic returns and primary health care, primary education, and infrastructure. Sort of uh, uh, unemployment compensation, sick care compensation, that sort of things would go down. And instead, you should have priority for education and primary health care and so on. Tax reform to lower marginal rates and broaden the tax base. Interest rate liberalization, no sort of credit or interest rate controls. A competitive exchange rate. That's a difficult concept, but uh, 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 an exchange rate that you can compete with other countries. Trade liberalization. No sort of hinders, no, no uh, customs and so on. Liberalization of inflows of foreign direct investments. Quite okay for capitalists to come in and invest and also take out the profits from the country. Privatization of public sector. Deregulation to abolish barriers to entry and exit for companies. And secure property rights. And this man, who is that? No, nobody knows, probably. He was also an Economy Prize winner. His name was Douglas North. 1993, he got the Swedish, the Swedish Economy Prize. Uh, has always followed the sort of trends. So, yeah, he was a very good representative for the spirit of 1993. He said, short summary, property rights are not a simple matter of supplying police protection, but rather of formulating legal rights and liabilities in such a way that the benefits and costs of economic action accrue as far as possible to the actor. 
His favorite example, I think, was what happened in England, 1688 or something where they had new laws giving possibilities for businessmen to develop in a certain amount of freedom. That was much more important than anything else that happened in England or Britain in those times. Uh, this service to give those laws, so to say, is of great benefit for a government that charges appreciably for its exercising the power arising from its monopoly of force. So in a very simplified way, you must have a big army and a big police force so to see to it that private property rights are secured. That's the message. He was an old Marxist. It's very typical that old Marxists tend to go in that direction, many of them. And here is another man. I don't know if he also was an old Marxist, but anyway, Nathan Rosenberg, his friend and colleague to North, he said, the failure of planning can be attributed in parts to its conception of an economic system as a lifeless machine without the internal capacity to change, adapt, and renew. At best, it is a so-bred shadow of a natural animal. They are good at language, those guys. And what happened in Eastern Europe? I have a very good friend who came from Poland, and he has explained what they said to me. And I think it's no coincidence that many of the real sort of right-wing liberal uh, persons uh, in Sweden today come from Eastern Europe. They were so tired of the old Soviet system that they took quotes taken from leading economists in Eastern Europe. We are tired of experiments. Let us not waste any more time but go for the only time-tested system that works, however imperfect it may be, capitalism. And another one, why bother with those complicated institutional arrangements which mimic capitalism when you can have the real thing? And this man, you, you are very young, but you probably remember him, who is Yeltsin. He hired a number of political economists, and Josef Stieglitz, a quite famous economist, I will come back to him, he called them Jacobins, or Bolsheviks from the right. They recommended the so-called shock therapy, a fast transition to capitalism, sell out public property in a very fast way. And in Russia, or a Soviet, a massive privatization program based on a voucher system was implemented in Russia in 1992. Uh, I think I saw some figure that uh, if you try to take the value uh, in a sort of uh, capitalist market sort of evaluation of the total privatized industry in Russia, in those years, sold out. Uh, they were sold out for around 10% of the sort of real value. So it was really a very sort of realization of a big, huge property. And everyone was giving a voucher. Yes? I mean, Russian people were not used to own things. And probably those persons formulating, it was an economist called Gaidar and other, uh, and uh, Jeffrey Sachs came from the United States, and uh, Swede Anders Oslund uh, was also hired as an expert, and they recommended you must sell it cheap because people will not 
accept it otherwise. That was probably the sort of thinking. Um, and uh, everyone was giving this little piece of paper saying that you have a right to a certain part of this. But people were extremely poor. I was there in, yes, exactly this year, 92. And it was a really, I mean, you could see old women sitting in the, in the uh, tunnel uh, in, the metro in a metro station, yes, selling uh, vodka bottles to survive. I mean, uh, so most, uh, majority of the people, they sold their voucher at once. And who had the knowledge to understand the meaning of those vouchers? That, of course, the old nomenclatura, uh, the leading communists, they knew how to buy up vouchers. Yeah. You could, uh, you could buy a share in one of those sold out companies to equal value, yes. And the value of those shares was very, very low in the beginning. But they didn't dare, P poor people uh, didn't dare to do anything else than to sell them and buy some bottles of vodka for, <laughs> for them instead. So uh, in those years, what we today call the oligarchs, not only the old sort of nomenclatura sort of people, but also some smart persons managed to buy very, very big parts of, of Russian industry. And of course, this system led to corruption and mistrust. Declining productivity, a high fixed ruble dollar exchange rate, an inefficient taxation system, and a war in che Chechnya, 94 to 96, led to a chronic fiscal deficit in Russia. Also a decline in demand for, and thus price of crude oil and non-ferrous metals severely impacted Russian foreign exchange reserves. In May 98, coal miners went on strikes over unpaid wages, blocking the Trans-Siberian Railway. And despite a $22.6 billion loan from International Monetary Fund and World Bank, in July, interest payments on Russia's debt rose to 40% higher than its tax collection. And on the 29th of July, Yeltsin chose Vladimir Putin as boss for federal security. Here he is. The ruble was devalued and oil prices increased. And in 99, unemployment fell. The economy recovered. And in March 2000, Putin was elected president. And of course, the Russian people associated him with the recovery. That's the most important thing if you are a politician, perhaps. That is to be elected in the right moment to take over the government in the right moment when the economy is going up, then you can be. So I, I'm not, I hope you don't think that I'm sounding cynical. I am not sort of a public choice sort of person. But of course, in Russia, with the old tradition of non-existing democracy, people saw him as a sort of hero. They thought that. He did it. He transformed Russia to something much better than during the crisis years. Well, uh, states who had followed neo-mercantilist policies, I call them, in May, you see, I don't talk about the dependence, school of dependence. Uh, Neo-mercantilist policies in Latin America were in the early 90s crisis hit by capital flight. In Brazil, under President Cardoso, 95 to 2000, a Washington consensus sort of policy was implemented. 
It led to a dramatic decline in inflation, but also to an overvalued currency. After a crisis, the left-winger and trade union leader Lula da Silva became president in 2000. Here, here is Cardoso and there is Lula. Apart for some land reforms, Lula followed similar policies. I think they were not very different. And the extreme left was, of course, disappointed. The extreme left is always disappointed. That's in Greece today and so on, but we'll come back to that. Uh, also in Argentina, the currency was fixed to the dollar. The economy shrank by 28% from 1998 to 2002, and the state went practically bankrupt. And seven out of 10 Argentine children were poor at the depth of the crisis. In 2002. And Chile had, after the coup 1973, followed the sort of Chicago boys' recipes and was hailed in those years in especially the United States as a positive example. Milton Freeman practically sent down his students to Santiago after the coup and they instructed Pinochet. Uh, uh, I tell you a funny story told by Stefan de Wilde, a friend of mine, a Swedish economist. He, he was there and he said that one of the first advices they have given that you must, in the taxi cars in Santiago, you must get rid of all taxameters. Instead, you must have on the top of the car a Griffeltavla. What's that? Uh, a, a yeah, sort of this sort of thing. A blackboard uh, saying what the, what is the price right, right now, and then you change the price all the time by supply and demand. That was one of the first reforms uh, in Chile. Um, here is Pinochet. Well, I will. Take this before also before the, we take a break. Uh, what happened in economics? Well, actually, this had happened long before, uh, but now you could say that the the field of economics in the beginning of the 90s got rid of all sort of Keynesian and uh, uh, socialist or other sorts of thinking, and the theory of free trade was restored. And we had two Swedes, quite well-known persons, Eli Heckscher and Bertel Olin. And they formulated a theory, said that a country will export goods that uses a relatively intensely abundant factor of production and import goods that uses a relatively scarce factor of production. So high-tech products in the north with scarce labor and abundant capital will be traded for raw materials and simpler products like textiles with high labor content and low wages together with scarce investment capital with a high rate of profit. This theory explained and on the same time legitimized the international division of labor. The neo-mercantilist idea was that it was good for the poor nations to break out of the logic of, of the world market because it was unfair in terms of trade. But this theory said that it was good. That's right, how it should be. Countries with low wages and abundant uh, number of workers should produce things that uses very much labor and little capital. And on the other way around, in the, in the north, the advanced capitalism, you should produce advanced industrial products, and then you should trade. And also this theory, here are Heckscher and Olin, and Paul Samuelson, I talked about him the last time. And others developed the theory further. They said that if you assume perfect competition in international trade, then the product prices will be equal everywhere. 
And so in the long run, there will be also be an equalization of costs and income between the north and the south. So wages will go up in the poor parts of the world and, uh, and also uh, the rate of profits will equalize if you just have full competition in trade all over the world. So everything will be good and everyone will, will be alike, sort of, a very optimistic sort of idea. And in 1995, those GATT rounds that I talked about, the Bretton Woods sort of system, was replaced by World Trade Organization with, today it's 161 members, and even China and Russia are today members of this organization. And on the home page you can read, its main function is to ensure that trade flows as smoothly, predictably, and freely as possible. And if you take, for instance, automotive industry promotion programs in India, Indonesia, and China, or patent rules on pharmaceuticals and agriculture chemical products in India, and credit subsidies for the aircraft industry in Brazil, they were all found to be inconsistent with WTO rules. The result of Philip Morris lawsuit against the Australian government over the country's plan to strip company logos from cigarette packages and replace them with grisly images is not clear as far as I know anybody or you know what happened. I think it's still going on in this process. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, this famous TTEP, the Trans Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership uh, between the European Union and the United States, of course, they follow the spirit of WTO. Uh, so, to end with that, in the middle of the 90s, you could say, that. This is a sort of concept. The empire, if you want to use Hart Negri's concept, really had conquered the world. And the sort of spirit in academia was that nothing else works. You must have a system of this sort. Okay, shall we take a quarter of an hour break? <laughs>